Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by French Professor, who's doing something different today. You know, normally I just do new music reviews, but uh, my father's funeral is this week. I'm traveling out of town to go to the funeral, so I'm, I'm not quite able to review all the things that just came out on Friday. I'm going to get to it. It's been a great week for rap music, and I'm going to review uh, the new Makami and the new Slow Tie. But instead, what I want to do is I want to share with you a kind of a video essay. And it's a little bit political, so uh, if you don't like political content, you're not going to enjoy this, but it is very much tied into music. And all the things I'm going to be showing you are things that I've been teaching in the class that I created for hip-hop culture and rap music. So I've kind of like Frankenstein a couple of classes together about the crack epidemic and about NWA, and in sort of an interesting, what I believe to be interesting, political discourse, okay? So let's, uh, let's sort of talk about, you know, musically... You know, how, how are these two guys connected, you know, Jay-Z and, and West Side Gun? How, how are they both sort of symbols of America and uh, of American values? Okay, so let's get to my uh, PowerPoints here. I'm going to go share screen. I'm going to go desktop. All right, I'm going to go to my desktop there. And here's the question. Here's the provocative title. The crack epidemic was the American dream. Now, I'm being intentionally provocative. I understand the crack epidemic was terrible. But as I'm going to argue now, in a way, it is sort of designed by American culture, especially American culture of the 1980s. Even though it was apparently something which our country was very much against, I think it is something which might actually be a an efficient way of understanding the shortcomings of our country, by that I mean America, of our country's moral shortcomings when it comes to free market capitalism. Okay? Are you ready? If you heard that and you're pissed, I'll see you later. Okay? Uh, I, I am a capitalist. I don't think I'm not a capitalist. I'm not telling anyone to burn down uh, the state capital or anything like that. But I think it's worth talking about what are the shortcomings of these systems that we live under. Now, the whole way that I came to this was, you know, I, I did this whole lesson on Jay-Z. And I talked about Jay-Z as being a representation of the American dream and the American nightmare. Okay, so by American Nightmare, obviously, he's from the bad part of the country, meaning he's from the inner city, the neglected inner city, that he is poor and black, two things that America tries to reject and sweep under the rug. He, uh, from an underemployed part of the country, from a broken family, he was a crack, crack dealing criminal, a foul mouthed rapper, glorifies money, drugs, murder and guns, but he does it so well. He does all of those things so well that he went from a representation of the American nightmare to becoming a representation of the American dream. Okay, so to summarize how that works, uh, sorry, for some reason I keep getting these weird things with Google. Uh, hello, okay, Google. I I don't I don't want to talk to you, Google. Okay. How does he represent the American dream? Well, pretty clear. Anyone can make it. He did. He came from the Marcy Projects of Brooklyn. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. He did. He's an entrepreneur who owns the nets in many paintings by Jean-Michel Basquiat. Liberty, freedom, and justice for all, the American dream. He has access to the corridors of power and equality. He and his family will have access to that power for generations. Democracy leads to fair representation. Another one of the great American dreams, how he is friends with several presidents, okay? And finally, capitalism leads to prosperity for all. Look at him, he came from nothing and he's a billionaire. So it was through this kind of lens that I thought, well, it's interesting, right? To have Jay-Z represent both of these things at the same time and don't get it twisted, Jay-Z understands that. That's part of Jay-Z's brilliance and his genius is his ability to discuss how he incarnates both of those things. I'm not telling you anything that Jay-Z isn't telling you. I'm just telling you in a different way, a little bit more directly. Um, I have to stop doing that. I don't understand why that keeps happening. And seeing as he's somebody who came up during the crack epidemic of the 80s and 90s, it, it raises this question. If he is a, an expression of American values, both the nightmare and the dream, 
is the crack epidemic, which largely formed his his world and his worldview, is the crack epidemic itself a pure expression of American values? Let's find out, shall we? Let's think about let's think about the crack epidemic from a, from a different standpoint. Let's treat the crack epidemic as though it represents the American dream. Okay, how is how is that possible? Right? It's Jesus Christ, Google. It's possible because the history of crack is how a scientific innovation led to the creation of a desirable product. This is American stuff, okay? There's a problem in the market, and you go in and you solve it, and you profit off of that. This leads to entrepreneurship, which ultimately leads to dynamic distribution methods. Distribution of crack was a totally new, different kind of distribution method, okay? And a massive employment boom. Hundreds, if not thousands, of teenagers and young men across the country who were underemployed, who were underserved by the American state, who had public services cut drastically underneath them, they were in a state where they had nothing to do. And here they had access to employment. And we see small-time businessmen, small-time businessmen like a young Sean Carter, like uh, West Side Gun, go from rags to riches. The crack trade, as is depicted in rap music and as is described by people in it, is pure competition on the free market. You are looking for customers and profit. Okay, so let's just, what do I mean scientific innovation? How did this whole thing start in the first place? If you look up the crack epidemic, you know, on Encyclopedia Britannica, you'll find something like this, you know, during the early 80s, popularized afford affordability, discussing how it had devastating effects within African-American communities. Okay, but the, the real truth is that uh, it just got a lot easier or the drug importers were much more efficient in the late 70s. So what had been kind of marquee niche drug, all of a sudden there was way more of it. Uh, you could tell me in the comments, if you haven't already smashed the like bucket and comment, what is the number one rule of economics, supply and demand? So all of a sudden in the late 1970s, Good gravy. I, I don't know what's going on with that Google thing, but I have to stop it. All of a sudden, in the late 70s, we have a high supply and a staple demand. The staple demand for cocaine was primarily people treating it as a party drug or high functioning, high energy uh, jobs such as rock star or, or business broker. I don't know what. So there's, the price is going to go down. Today's price is not yesterday's price. Now, all of a sudden, the price was going down. Being a drug dealer was less profitable. This is where that American dream thing comes in, okay? What can you do if you have something that is valuable but has a limited amount of demand? Well, if it's a luxury item, create a low-end product. And then you move product, you move the profit into volume. How does Walmart work? <laughs> Walmart works by nickel and diming every single company they're with, getting the prices as low as possible, and then making as little money as possible on a jar of pickles. Okay, a jar of elastic pickles, they'll make like two cents off of that jar of pickles, but they sell 10 million jars of pickles. All of a sudden, they got. 20 million cents, okay? <laughs> That's how they work. They don't work on selling a jar of pickles for $10 and buying it for two, right? That's how the crack trade worked. Profit was in volume. So they had to make new customers. That's how it worked. They created new customers. If you actually look at cocaine and crack, it's the same thing. Chemically, just different mixing agents, okay? You couldn't physically, you had to denature the cocaine in order to smoke it. That's why crack is crack and why cocaine is cocaine. The interesting side effect of this is that snorting, it takes up to three to five minutes to affect your body, whereas smoking, because the blood vessels in your lungs are so great, it's almost instant. And the lasting effects are 15 to 30 minutes as opposed to five to 10 minutes with crack. This made crack more addictive. But the real kicker was how did it find these this new audience? So if it costs 120 to $150 for an eighth of a gram, it means that the 
that's the amount of money that you would have to have in order to buy a certain amount of cocaine. Well, all of a sudden, you could spend 10 to $25 for a tenth of a gram. There was a time in, in the 80s where uh, crack rocks were selling for 2 to $5 a piece. All of a sudden, the drug has been democratized. Horribly democratized. But still, when we return to the question of what makes a good capitalist, well, you have high supply and a stable demand. Why not have a high supply and a high demand by creating new customers? And that's what they did. They created a low-end product, they turned the profit into volume, and they made new customers. Now, let's, let's take this back a little bit. How, how did we get all this cocaine into America in the first place? You know, Who are the people who are responsible for this? You probably have some faces in your mind, okay? Pablo Escobar, certainly when you teach rap music, you have Kanye's life of Pablo Nas Escobar, uh, one of the biggest figures in rap history, is Pablo Escobar, the leader of the Medellin clan. Certainly, he was responsible for a lot of importation of cocaine. Or Griselda Blanco, if you're a fan of Griselda, named themselves after her, another great importer of cocaine. Or maybe you think, good gravy, stop it. Or maybe you think of someone who actually sold who was American, such as Freeway Rick Ross, the namesake for the prison guard turned rapper Rick Ross and the criminally underrated Freeway. So this might be how you envision, like who are the people at the top who are bringing in these drugs or who are helping these drugs get in? Okay, I'm, I'm just about to lose my mind to this. How can I not have that happen? Okay. Or, you know, maybe we'll end up with Tony Montana. Did, did you know Tony, Tony Montana is a Republican? Uh, statistically, most uh, immigrants from Cuba who came into America became like the main voting bloc of Republicans in Florida. So anyways, it's an interesting way of thinking about Tony Montana. Imagine him if he didn't get shot down. He would probably be uh, a big, big, big supporter of the Republican Party in South Florida. Just sort of statistically there so maybe that's what you picture but instead i'm going to add someone else to that i'm going to add ronald reagan president of the united states from 1980 to 1988 what do i mean well if we go back okay i'm just i'm just going to take you on a history lesson you're already here you've been here for a little while let's talk about nicaragua shall we you know anything about Nicaragua? I don't know much about Nicaragua. I'm going to tell you some things that happened in Nicaragua. Okay. Uh, there, oh my God. There, there was a civil war. Well, the Sandinistas, the communists, took over uh, from the quasi-democratically elected dynasty that existed in Nicaragua before the Sandinistas took power. So a communist government took play, took over. I'm not saying they're good, by the way. They committed many uh, uh, human rights violations, okay? So I'm not saying any of these people are inherently good, but the Sandinistas took power, and then there were the Contras, who were the anti-communist forces. If you're familiar with the Cold War, you're familiar with American foreign policy. Our foreign policy was to always wipe out communism and help people who are trying to wipe out communism at all costs, no matter what. Okay, the reasons for doing this are many. The stated reason is that we want to spread freedom in the world and that people who live in a communist country are less free and we need to help them. That's the stated bit. The underlying bit is actually that it's just a question of keeping our business interests alive, that, that we are a country that thrives on money and trade. And if countries are closed off, then we can't sell them Coca-Cola. Uh, we can't import bananas. We can't do all the things that we do that keep us so rich and powerful. Okay. So what does America do? Uh, well, initially, initially, actually, uh, Jimmy Carter well, it was in talks with the Sandinistas, but eventually we support the Contras, the anti-communists. Okay, I promise you this all has to do with rap music. It's, it's getting there soon. But eventually, Congress votes to stop support 
of these murderous contras. Because it turns out, oops, they were going door to door. And if you said you were a communist, they might put a bullet in your brain. You know, these kinds of things, these sort of things that in theory, if we're talking about who's going to be representing freedom, we don't usually represent them. But that's, you know, not not before. You know, not before Reagan has some of the contras in his office. Not before he has that sweet shirt with, uh, what was that, copper standard? Is that the font there? Stop communism, Central America. Missing a preposition there. Uh, but he's a big, big, big supporter of the Contras. Okay, He and his government are a big supporter of... But unfortunately, the Congress stops because you can't... You, you just, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side you are on, uh, you can't just support a civil war without... You can't just participate in a war in a different country without... Represent, representatives of the government supporting you because the government is supposed to represent the people and the people were not represented and they said no we don't want to support the Contras so what are you going to do okay the US government had a problem there are people in Nicaragua who are communist and there are people who are fighting the communists we need to fight the communists for freedom and also to ensure free trade, to ensure that other countries don't become communists so that we can continue to have all the bananas we want and sell all of the Coca-Cola that we can. So how are we going to get money to them? Well, let's figure out a way to make money and just not tell anybody. Let's give money to the Contras without telling them. So... You know what they did? This is, this is, you you might know the fact that this is not talked about all the time is really powerful. We sold weapons to one of our greatest enemies. We sold weapons to the country which, what, se uh, seven years, six years earlier, had started the death to America chant to Iran who we had basically supported Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war, very complicated, but we sell weapons to Iran, we take all that money, and then we give that money to the Contras. Perfect, except for one thing, it's highly illegal. You can't do that. I, I promise this is going somewhere, okay? When Ronald Reagan was asked, hey, why did you do that? Did you know this was happening? And he just said, I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. So someone ended up being kind of the fall guy, a guy named Oliver North. Um, and he sort of went to prison. So he's basically the face of this entire thing, basically one of the main architects of it, uh, acting on behalf of, presumably on behalf of his president. Um, but he went to jail and, uh, you know, he's just lived in ignominy ever since. You know, it's not like he has some kind of wild platform. It's not like he's been turned into some sort of hero by people who think that selling weapons to Iran and giving money to murderous uh, rebels is in Amer in the American interests. You know, that's all over North. So what does this all have to do with anything? See, the thing is, is that this is about American foreign policy. And American foreign policy puts a priority on worldwide domination of free market capitalism. That's the goal, okay? I am not saying this is good or bad. You can have your own opinion, okay? Say what you will about Reagan, but he probably did have a huge hand to play in the downfall of communism in the world. Whether or not that's good or bad is up to you. I personally can't help but say, well, there's... Probably mostly good came out of that, but I'm not particularly interested in saying good or bad right now. That's not what really interests me. What interests me is consequences. How how does all this lead to Jay-Z and to gangster rap? Okay. If the priority is free market capitalism, and if convenient democracy, we don't democracy is is nice, but it's not actually the focus of, of US foreign policy, at least for the most part. Okay, but free market capitalism has to exist and has to thrive so that our businesses can continue to succeed and, depending on your your position, exploit other markets. Okay, that's how we keep everything going. 
Which brings us to this particular gentleman here, Oscar Danilo Blandon. He was one of Freeway Rick Ross's primary suppliers of cocaine. Freeway Rick Ross is generally considered to be the most influential of the crack dealers. He was the main supplier in, in the West Coast. Although the West Coast was not the origin, the first place that crack was ever sold, it was its most influential, and the crack epidemic is seen by many as spreading out from California. So a lot of it goes back to Rick, uh, Rick Ross, who, by the way, is a very interesting guy. He does a lot of interviews now. You can watch him on YouTube. It's an interesting guy. So why am I talking about one of his plugs, Okay, one of his suppliers? Well, because he ended up being one of the major sources of cocaine in the West Coast. But the thing is, he supported the Contras. He left Nicaragua and supported the Contras. And the American government knew. Now, the San Jose Mercury Times reported on this. The reporter who reported it ended up being so disgraced, he ended up killing himself. I mean, obviously, it's not like whatever. I'm not going to say that he he was forced to kill himself because of this, but obviously the disgrace that was put on him, the idea that he was being treated as a kook would be met later by the CIA explicitly saying, yes, it is true. We did know Blandon was a cocaine dealer and we did not pursue him. He was eventually raided, but when they raided this major cocaine trafficker, they didn't find much cocaine at all. This is the point of contention. Everybody knows that the American government knew who he was and what he did, and they were okay with it because he supported the Contras. American foreign policy is not about stopping drug trafficking. It is about supporting free market capitalism above all else. Okay, That is the evidence that is being put before us. Some claim that the CIA called Blandon and said, you better flush everything. He <laughs> better throw everything into the, into the ocean because the police are coming. I don't, have a, I don't have an opinion on that. That's just what some people say. So when we think about the crack epidemic, okay? When we think about the crack epidemic and what happened, it's not accurate to say that the US government is the reason that the crack epidemic happened. But it is also clear that it did not do everything it could to stop it. This epidemic that was primarily affecting the inner city of the of United of uh, of American cities. So, do you see how it all works? Dynamic distribution methods and massive un massive employment boom and small time businessmen like Rick Ross. You know, but of course, it was also it was also a place of the American nightmare where a highly addictive, inexpensive drug floods the streets. The poor and the disenfranchised are hit the hardest. More customers meant there was more money, right? You didn't just have to rely on like one rich douchebag to make money on cocaine. You could have 20 people. The problem was when you had more customers, you had more money. When you had more in order to have more customers, you need more territory because it's not a question of going and finding the person to sell it to. You have to sell to everybody in a specific area. So if you have to sell to people in an area, it means you have to hold down that area. And this is free money. This is just people getting hooked on this stuff and just throwing money at you. This is a bunch of people living in a place that is completely devoid of governmental support and employment opportunities being flooded with free money everywhere. And all you have to do to make that money is control a certain plot of land. How are you going to do that? You're going to do that by ganging up with your gangs. It was because of the crack epidemic that the gangs, especially in places like Los Angeles, became much more profitable. It wasn't just a question. It was kind of a small time operation, but crack really made these gangs much more profitable and much more necessary. And at the same time, you can't be sitting there attacking in the gang fights with the chains and the, and, and the switchblades. Toby, 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 I'm talking about the crack epidemic. I need you to not bark. This led to more guns. Having more guns, more gangs. It was all a direct result of this crack epidemic. This led to more deaths, more murders, both within gangs, ODs, and bystanders as well. Neighborhoods and families are destroyed. 
it's one of my policies in life that if enough people tell me something, I just have to believe them. The great example of this is when I was younger, I didn't believe how tough it was to be a woman with how many men were lecherous and would say weird, gross things to them. I didn't believe them because I didn't say those gross, lecherous things myself. I've since come to realize, oh, yes, that is their reality. You just have to believe them. I have known enough people who lived through the crack epidemic in the inner cities of America in the 80s and 90s to the point where it was just, it was last of us, okay? It was walking dead. It was just like one day it's one thing, the next day it's gone. It's destroyed. All in the name of creating this product and making sure that these small businessmen can make the most money they possibly can. Proliferation of gangs, guns, drugs, all of it. Now, the most insidious and fascinating thing about this is the governmental question, how can they fight this? You know, how can they fight this? How can they fight this? Do they want to fight this? It's unclear. It's unclear how much the US government actually cared about the crack epidemic. I suppose it depends on how, how, uh, how cynical you are. You know, Nancy Reagan launched her famously impotent uh, campaign of Just Say No. I grew up in the Just Say No era. It means nothing. It was completely worthless. Waste of air, waste of time. People trying to feel good about themselves. Nothing. But obviously, the most important part was how it furthered the war on drugs. The war on drugs declared by uh, Richard Nixon in 71. This is one of the ways that we lost the war on drugs. And all these things come together. Do you understand? Do you understand? All these things come together to how do we get this music? that represents our culture, okay? Because the war on drugs, in particular, the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act. Anti-Drug Abuse Act. Does that say Anti-Drug Importation Act? Does that say Anti-Drug Dealing Act? No, that says Drug Abuse Act. Who are the drug abusers? The people who use the drugs. It's targeting the users. All users? Not really. Ends up being one specific kind of user, which are primarily the poor, people of color in the inner cities of America. Mandatory minimum. This is when that concept is introduced. Obama would overthrow it in 2010. One of the things that he did that was great, where the mandatory minimum meant that if you got, you had drugs, there's a mandatory minimum sentence you had to serve with huge consequences on the rest of your life. This ended up also militarizing the police force The dealers would be consistently de dehumanized as monsters and the prison population would explode by a factor of tens and hundreds at times. This maximum minimum, of course, you've probably seen this before, but if you got caught with five grams, it's five-year sentence without uh, parole of crack. If you got caught with 500 grams of powder cocaine, that's five years sentence without parole. The, the inequality of this was targeted to ensure that primarily poor people of color were going to jail in the war on drugs. That was the goal. If it wasn't the goal, that was the outcome. If it wasn't the goal, it was a predictable outcome. If it wasn't the goal, it could have been overturned before 2010. Hey, Clinton, you took power. Why didn't you over? Why didn't you undo it? You didn't undo a Bush either. Okay. If you haven't seen it, watch What is the Drug War by Jay-Z with Molly Crabapple. It's a beautiful thing on YouTube. It doesn't have that many views compared to how, you know, compared to how many views uh, most things Jay-Z does have. It's a beautiful artistic depiction of this drug war and the impact that it has. In my class, I got to show them. So in my class, I, I constantly bring this quote from Angela Davis, great uh, militant revolutionary, academic, intellectual. Critical aesthetic representations of a social problem must be understood as constituting powerful and social political acts, which I have simplified for my class as saying artistic representations of crime must be understood as a political act against equality. Or in the case of this, Talking about selling crack is an indictment of the country of America and its system and its values and the way that it has failed the American people. 
If you say, yo, I sold a red top for $2 and I got fiends all over, it might sound like you're just bragging about being an awesome crack dealer. But at the same time, every time you say that, it is a reminder of the ways that the American state has failed. Which is why in my class, I talk a lot about iced tea. Ice-T, who is considered to be the first or second gangster rapper. I first talk about Schooly D, but I'm not going to talk about him because I'm trying to stay in LA for this video. You know, Ice-T, he was a pretty interesting guy. He's from New Jersey, was in the military, did a lot of like, <laughs> you watch like early Ice-T, he's like doing lots of weird like, dude, 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 dude. He wasn't at all a gangster, um, but he did release the first LA gangster rap song. Um, and I don't, I don't talk about cop killer in my class because that's a heavy metal song, not a rap song. Just because a black guy sings it doesn't mean it's rap music. It was heavy metal music. He also, of course, did some acting as a police officer. Anyways, when we think about six in the morning, okay, which is considered to be the first West Coast gangster rap song, a day in the life of a dealer, a pimp, a gangster, a woman beater, a guy who goes to jail, constantly in altercations with police, a murderer, the sound influence of PSK, what does it mean by Schooly D is very clear, produced by Africa Islam, who interestingly enough was in uh, the Rocksteady crew, he used to be a, a break dancer. And we have with Ice-T the prototypical modern rapper. We have the blueprint for Jay-Z with the song six in the morning. So I'm not going to play the song for you because I don't want to be copyright strike. So I will, I will sing it for you. Six in the morning, police at my door, fresh Adidas squeak across the bathroom floor. Out, out, out the back window, I make an escape. Didn't even get, get a chance to grab my old school tape. Mad with no music, but I'm happy because I'm free. And the streets to a player is the place to be. Got a knot in my pocket, weighing at least a grand. Gold on my neck, my pistols close at hand. I'm a self-made monster of the city streets, remotely controlled by hard hip-hop beats. But just living in the cities is a serious task. Didn't know what the cops wanted. Didn't have time to ask. <laughs> word so what's interesting about this opening here is what he's actually depicting is the reality of compton at in the 80s okay the police are at his door all right he has a knot in his pocket meaning he's rich we don't know how he's rich we assume it's from either being a pimp or from selling uh selling drugs the police are there didn't know what they want didn't have time to ask just around the time that he released this, there was another song called Batter Ram. This was the reality of what was happening in Compton and in South Central Los Angeles. These gigantic militaristic trucks were coming in, and if they suspected something of being a crack house, they would literally batter in the doors. Can you imagine living in a place where this happens? Can you imagine? Can you imagine living in a place where battering rams on cars crash into your neighbor's house? Here's a pin from the LAPD. Rock houses beware. Guess they were proud of it. There's Nancy Reagan. There she is again. Just say no. She she went along with the uh, police commissioner on a raid of a rock house. They didn't find anything in the house, but don't worry. They completely destroyed the house. She must have been a little disappointed. They didn't just say no. Maybe they did say no, Nancy. You won. And there's this one line from the song, which I think is the central line of the song, and I think is the central message of all gangster rap and all crack rap. The batter rams roll in, rocks are the thing, life has no meaning, and money is king. It's all here. The batter rams rolling, representing the police state, representing state power being brought down on the citizens of the inner city. Rocks are the thing. Crack is the thing. At this point in the song, he had just gotten out of jail and he came back and we got out of jail. The crack epidemic was in full swing and he realized that's how he had to make money. But look at this next line, this existentialist Mr. Meeseeks nightmare. Life has no meaning and money is king. This is it. This is the point. Life has no meaning and money is king. 
That's the emptiness behind the crack wrapper. They have the car, they have the jewelry, they have the fashion, they have everything. But those things have replaced community, have replaced love, have replaced connections, have replaced meaning. Life has no meaning and money is king. Congratulations, you have just cracked the code. That's the American dream. The American dream is not the European dream of living your life in balance and having lots of vacation and eating well. The American dream is money is king and you have all the money. So in that way, crack dealers represent the failure of the American hyper-capitalist state. But maybe not. You know, who is, it, who is an 80s hero, you know? I grew up in the 80s. Yeah, Marty McFly. Yeah, cool. Gremlins. Star Wars. Both kinds. <laughs> Stop this. There's a video game called Contra, by the way. I love this game. Whatever I know, the Konami code. But it's really messed up. There's a video game named after the Contras. Anyways, when we think about 80s and American heroes, we think of G.I. Joe, you know, like Duke here. You know, there's, there, there's a whole cartoon. G.I. Joe, a real American hero. It was a comic strip. I mean, a comic book as well. G.I. Joe, a real American hero. But, you know, the question is, who is the real, real American hero of the 1980s? I'm going to propose a different personality. And this is going to come from rap music. Oh, my God, Google. It's going to come from the first single by Eze and NWA. Now, Boys in the Hood was considered to be the first real, 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 real gangster rap song written by Ice Cube, performed by Eze. But then the B side was a song called Dope Man, which would then both these songs would be redone on later NWA and Eze projects. But it's Dope Man that I think is the most important song for us to understand. So we've talked about Bush and Reagan foreign policy, but what about Bush and Reagan domestic policy? Who are the godfathers of gangster rap? Is it Ren and Yella and Easy and Dre and Cube? Or maybe it's our old friends again. Maybe the true godfathers of gangster rap are Reagan and Bush in their attempts to make America great again. Their domestic policies were dominated by the belief of small government, okay? Privatizing business, taking them out of the public sector and giving them to the private sector. In theory, the private sector would fight for the lowest prices and the consumer would win. In practice, the, the private companies became monopolistic and bled us dry. But hey, it was a theory. Social programs were cut. Essential, like job programs in South Central Los Angeles that were started by Nixon, were cut by Reagan, okay? Even Nixonian projects were too big for the Reagan-Bush era. Lower taxes, not lower taxes for everybody, lower taxes especially for the rich. The theory was, if you let the rich people pay less taxes, that money will trickle down. If you tell a billionaire he doesn't have to pay any taxes, he will give a million dollars to the people underneath him, and then that will go down and will go down to the bottom. Now, in reality, every single billionaire is a pig fucker who wants to have $2 billion, and they take the money, and they just try to double it and triple it and quadruple it so that they can go to space, okay? But the principle was that it would help out. The principle didn't work, much like the privatization of business. Diabolical bit, that's tough on crime. It's supposed to say tough, not touch. Tough on crime, especially on drugs. So you had the sort of minimal governmental oversight on finance. So this is where we had a huge spiraling of uh, malfeasance by people making a ton of money. But little tiny crimes were punished super heavily. So the poor who were trying to get $5 were thrown in jail for five years. The rich who were trying to get a billion dollars were slapped on the wrist and then given positions at, at banking firms, Okay. And it's all this hypercapitalism with the trickle down economics, all hypercapitalist. The thing is, it's 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 crack. It's gangster rap. This is totally congruent with NWA. 
I don't care if the FBI wrote the NWA a letter saying, oh, you know, like just here's just some graphs so you understand. And to be clear, I'm making this political, but it's not like Clinton or Obama did anything meaningful to bridge the, the, the wealth gap. You see what things look like from the 70s up until the 80s when the policy started changing. You saw how they spiraled out of control where the rich got richer and the poor got poor. You see that bottom 90%. You understand that you're part of that bottom 90%. You understand that every president since Reagan has been making this worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. You understand that, right? That's where we are. Change in share of income. Okay. This is where we are since 2008. It's not gotten any better. It's only gotten worse. So what do all these things mean? What is their message? Government won't get in your way. Government won't help you. You're on your own. Dog eat dog. Get yours. Get paid. Get all the money. Not some of it. All the money. So let's look at Dope Man by NWA. Written by Ice Cube. A, a middle class poet with a uh, degree in architectural design, who also happened to be the primary voice of NWA and the architect of the gangster rapper. I mean, Jay-Z even has a song on here called Dope Man, which is trying to say that he's not a dope man. But part of what makes Jay-Z such an interesting character is he was a dope man. Let's, With all of these messages in mind, let's think about Dope Man. Once again, I'm not going to play it, but I will rap it to the best of my ability. I will do my best imitation of Ice Cube. Well, that without swearing. It was once said by a man who couldn't quit. Dope man, please, can I have another hit? The dope man said, Cluck, I don't give an ish if your girl kneels down and mm, mm, mm. It all happened and the guy tried to choke her. Mm, living cash, selling to smokers. That's the way it goes. That's the name of the game. Young brother getting over by sl slang and cane. Gold around his neck, 14K habit. Mm, on his mm, 24 7 plus he's making money keep the base heads waiting rolling 64 six rolling in a six four of the fresh ass datings living in compton california ca his uzi up your uh if you don't get paid mm, begging for credit he's knocking out teeth clocking much dollars on the first and 15th this is a pure expression of all of the values i just showed you these are pure hyper-capitalist values. He is living in Compton, California, where he is from, his community. He is taking people from his community. And not only is he taking their money, he's humiliating them, he's debasing them, cuckolding them, and doing everything he possibly can to dehumanize them. He calls them clucks, not human beings, okay? But nothing matters because he has the gold around his neck, 14K, he has it. Life has no meaning and money is king. That's this whole verse. This whole verse. He's just exploiting and clocking much dollars on the 1st and 15th, being paydays, meaning people are taking their money and they're giving it to him. It's not enough to have some of the money and you have to have all of the money. Don't get it twisted. NWA is, on one hand, a revolutionary group to challenge the status quo. But in another way, they and the rest of the crack rappers and the rest of these hyper-capitalistic rappers are wonderful lapdogs for the hyper-capitalist state. That's the paradox. And it's worth mentioning. It's worth studying. Because Jay-Z, West Side Gun, any other crack rapper you want to talk about ends up being in the same place where they highly desensitize, they highly dehumanize the people they're selling to. They dehumanize people in their neighborhood, the neighborhood that was destroyed by this thing. They are just so busy being good entrepreneurs that everything else is subservient. As he says later in the song, it's all about the money. The Reagan-Bush message is in fact the crack rap message, which leaves us with this, the true godfathers of gangster rap. Their beliefs shaped the mentality of gangster rap. Their negligence created the material conditions of gangster rap the burned out wastelands of Compton, as an example, the underfunded social programs, the over-policing, the over-incarceration. Their drug war 
first of all, allowed in a lot of drugs, while at the same time making sure the price of those drugs was high and raised the stakes and made the crack wrapper seem like a dangerous, cool outlaw. Fundamentally, what they did was they sold the dream and then they filled the prisons with the dreamers. And that's what our country has not healed from. Our country is not healed from the crack epidemic. The American cities that were hit by it have an entire generation that was wiped out by this, either by its presence or incarceration and the war on drugs. And so I'm not saying this was on purpose. I'm not saying that, that Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and, or Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or anybody wanted to destroy the African-American community with this very specific drug and this way of simultaneously encouraging and incarcerating people who sell it, of, of depriving people of basic human needs and then incentivizing them to do something that will get them thrown in jail. I'm not saying it's on purpose, but I am saying it happened and it's happening. And it's why, <laughs> it's why gangster rap is also called reality rap. If we go back, you know, if we go back, to a certain extent, Ice Cube is revolutionary because maybe he's not actually trying to make Dope Man a hero. Maybe he's just telling the truth that this is what's happening. Maybe that's what it is. Quick side note, Tony Montana was a Republican. <laughs> not for nothing, Easy e also a Republican. He went to lunch with President Bush. Only in America. That's pretty much the reaction. I mean, hardcore rapper Eze e of NWA, famous scene circulating amongst the GOP nobility, is a member of the National Republican Senatorial Committee Inner Circle. Okay, a reminder: this is not always revolutionary music. Of course, Ice Cube, even though he released America KKK's Most Wanted, one of the best political rap albums of all time, uh, last year said uh, Donald Trump is what Americans aspire to be. I actually don't think he deserves too much too much criticism here because uh, he might be saying this might be a backhanded compliment likened Donald Trump to the American dream. So who is the real American hero of the 1980s? You know, it's the dope man. That's the real American hero. That's the small business entrepreneur who saw the values that surrounded him and in the name of free market capitalism abroad and at home he fought for his individual freedom and his individual dominance over all those around him why is the dope man still the number one rap 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 archetype why are we still flooded with rap songs by people talking about selling crack it's because we still live in the same world we still live in a world where the batter rams roll in, rocks are the thing, life has no meaning, money is king. I don't have a solution. I think the solution is probably more of an investment in uh, infrastructure, Yeah, in the inner city, more governmental programs, more outreach, uh, better enforcement of, of, uh, of the drug policy at higher levels. I don't know. I don't know. But... I think we can say that crack dealers reflect the failures and the successes of the American hyper-capitalist state. So is crack the American dream? Yep. Is crack the American nightmare? Yep. There it is. There's my video. Damn it. I needed to like do something as a better ending to that. Oh, I could, I could show you my Patreons. They give, they give me money. Oh, geez, this is all like fuzzy. They give me money to uh, buy music. Like I bought this. And, you know, it sounds like I'm moralizing, you know, like I, this music is great. And I think that the best way to understand it is that it is either glamorizing these things or it is describing these things. And in its description, as Angela Davis would say, it is a, a political act. So I'm not going to say that NWA or Jay-Z are definitively intentionally supporting these values, but they are reflecting them. All right.
Till next time, there's the camera.